some things in this bag. <laughs> I'm Dr. Kirstine Kim. I'm Professor of Theology and World Christianity and also Associate Dean of the Centre for Missiological Research, which is part of the School of Intercultural Studies here at Fuller Theological Seminary. I'm going to be talking about two books from the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, Habakkuk and Zephaniah. be defined very narrowly in terms of preaching a, a message and calling people to change their their lives or it can be defined more much more broadly in terms of participating in God's mission in the world so I, I think of the the prophets in in these terms they were people who were called by God they were empowered by the Holy Spirit and they played a particular role in God's, God's mission and God's purposes in the world. So we've got two books here next to each other in the Bible, Habakkuk and Zephaniah. They were both written about 600 years before Jesus was, was born. And yet these were men who spoke by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is not some... Uh, not something that appears at, at Pentecost only as a kind of an afterthought or a kind of further stage of God's revelation. In the scriptures, we read about how the Holy Spirit is there right from the beginning all the way through. At the very beginning, the Spirit broods or moves over the waters, bringing about creation. The Spirit speaks through the prophets, and of course the Spirit is ultimately revealed and embodied in, in, the, in Jesus himself and his life and ministry. So um, we, have, we have two books. We have two words from the Spirit of God. And the first one, the book of, of, um, of Habakkuk, encourages people to, to wait for a vision of God to live by faith and to practice God's justice in history. Habakkuk looks forward to a day of when justice will be done so that the people can live in peace and well-being. And um, I like this uh, this tree of life um, that I got while we were living in, in India as an expression of the that vision that the prophets look to when every person will sit under their vine and will plough their field and will there will be plenty and there will be colour and life. So the prophet Habakkuk in the first chapter wonders how this is going to come about because this is a really turbulent time for the people of Israel. They're, they're pressed on all sides by antagonistic nations. So Habakkuk wonders how God is going to bring about those purposes. And in the first chapter, he wonders perhaps whether God will mobilize a, a warring nation like the Chaldeans to come and just destroy everything and get rid of all the evil, of all the corrupt people, of the people who are taking advantage of the weak, weaker members of society who are excluding others, who are idolizing things that that are not are not God. But at the end of the chapter he comes to the conclusion that no, the God that he knows isn't like that. God will not destroy the nations without mercy. That's not the God he's talking about. He's conscious of God's love and compassion for the people and being overrun by the Chaldeans will just make their lives worse, not better. So, and as he moves on into chapter two, he talks about a vision, a vision that's going to be, as it were, sort of written on the side of the mountain in letters so big that somebody who's running fast can still can still read it. It's a vision um, uh, of the earth being filled with the knowledge and glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And that vision is going to come to pass when God is 
back in his holy temple, in his rightful place. And all the earth then will keep silence before him. And he concludes his short uh, prophecy, it was just three chapters long, with a psalm. And the psalm gives praise for God's glorious works and praise that we in our time will experience those glorious works. And one of the closing verses is a great expression, a classic expression of faith in God, even though Habakkuk doesn't see how this is going to be worked out and played out exactly. Um, he, he says th that he's going to believe in God. And though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no fruit, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation." The second prophet that we're looking at, Zephaniah, has a, a similar sense of impending doom. Dreadful things are, are going to happen. Um, and he's searching for God's purpose in all of this. There's going to be horrific devastation on a cosmic scale, says Zephaniah. But he celebrates the deliverance that will come through this because this, the world has come to such a sorry state. I think to illustrate this book, this um, icon that I brought back recently from a conference at the Orthodox Academy in, in Crete, which shows the last judgment, it captures something of, of the awful things that... Zephaniah talks about, and also the hope that he lifts up. Zephaniah talks at the beginning about how God's going to sweep away everything from the face of the earth. And the things that he's most uh, keen to get rid of are idolatrous priests, officials who usurp power more than they should have, traders who don't use the right measures, and anyone who doesn't fear the Lord and doesn't and is complacent about their their lives. And this is going to be the great day of the Lord. And, and throughout the the prophecy we hear this phrase, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord which is near, it's coming fast. Um, and it's going to be, and I quote from um, the first chapter, verse uh, 15, the day of the Lord will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry. So there, all these awful things are going to happen, but that's not the end of what Zephaniah has to say, because this destruction, although widespread, um, because there are going to be some, the humble of the land, who do God's commands, who are going to rise out of this destruction. There's a remnant of the house of Judah that's going to be saved and who will eventually um, inhabit the land. But to date, this land has listened to no voice, has accepted no correction, has not trusted in the Lord, has not drawn near to its God. So this devastation and destruction will be necessary in Zephaniah's view in order to leave a people who are humble and lowly, a remnant that um, does no wrong and utters no lies. And in that situation... <laughs> We're back to the tree of life again. They will pasture and lie down and no one will make them afraid. And there's a message to the daughter of Zion, uh, a tender message saying how God will re um, rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing and at that time also there's a promise a bit like the one that 
Jesus made in Luke chapter four. I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. So then back to mission and our mission to call out injustice, to live humbly, to think of the good of all people, of our neighbours, of the whole world, and to expect and be ready for and be living in a way that is appropriate for the day of the Lord. <laughs>